grab a cup of coffee and start your Sunday with Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Every Sunday morning at 9 on the Talk of New York, AM 970, The Apple. Visit CYACYL.com. Good morning. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Completing a 2.4-mile swim, a 112-mile bike ride, and a 26.2-mile run would be, to say the least, a difficult task for almost anyone. Now, imagine doing it with a prosthetic leg. Today's guest, Sarah Reinerton, stepped onto the world stage after making sports history as the first woman on a prosthetic leg to finish the Ironman World Championships. Sarah is an athlete, motivational speaker, mentor, and author of the book, In a Single Bound. She raced around the world on the amazing race, the Emmy Award-winning reality TV series. Sarah continues to race in triathlons and road races and is a three-time ITU paratriathlete world champion. She's raced on the U.S. Paralympic track team, breaking world records, and winning awards including ESPN's ESPY for Best Female Athlete of the Year. Sarah's story has been covered in national newspapers, and she's graced the covers of Runner's World, Triathlete, and ESPN Magazine. Sarah was recently featured on a Nike commercial. Good morning, Sarah. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning, Joan. It's good to be here. Sarah, you were born with a congenital birth defect that resulted in the amputation of your leg when you were seven. And then at age 13, you broke the 100-meter world record for female above-the-knee amputee. Can you tell us a little bit about this incredible journey? How did you go from this type of surgery at age 7 to an amazing accomplishment at age 13? Well, you know, I, I think um, I, ju- I had a, a desire to be an athlete as a kid. And, you know, having this challenge or this birth defect didn't really change that, you know. But I didn't really have my outlet until I discovered disabled sports. But... Yeah, you know, growing up, I had this um, birth defect uh, called PFFD, and um, I wore this leg brace, and then eventually they amputated so I could wear, like, a prosthetic leg. And having my leg amputated at seven was hard, but I think in some ways, too, when you're a kid, you kind of, um, I I don't think you have in some ways the same hang-ups that you do as an adult. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, of course, you do have your parents to rely on, and I really credit my parents with... um, uh, giving me a lot of chutzpah, and I think they definitely, you know, um, you know, I think the, the, the name of your show sort of definitely reflects what I adapted as a kid early on, you know, change your attitude, change your life, and I, my parents didn't really allow me to feel sorry for myself. It was sort of like you have to just sort of get on with it, and, and in just the same way, you know, my dad had to wear his glasses, I was going to have to wear this prosthetic leg and strap it on every day and carry on. And, uh, you know, I definitely I chose to do that. And then I wanted to run on that leg and go faster and achieve more. And, and uh, you know, it was great that I had sports as a goal um, for something, you know, for me to channel uh, that kind of energy into. And so... Um, you know, that definitely helped uh, shape my attitude that I think has built my life. And Sarah, I can't agree with you more. The attitude, positive attitude is the key to everything. But for some of our listeners that may be going through a similar experience as to what you did at that young age, I want them to get a, a true sense that it wasn't always a, a very happy time for you. I, I had heard a story that you had shared about a soccer coach. So can you just share something so that they can see that there is hope and that it isn't always going to be this way for them? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, certainly uh, I've gone through some challenges uh, along the way and certainly challenging uh, people's attitudes of what a woman can and cannot do and or being a woman with a disability or a girl with a disability. I, you know, I've talked about um, being a kid and uh, my parents signed me up to be in the town soccer league and the soccer coach really wouldn't include me in the practices and uh, the drills and so forth because um, he would just, you know, give me a soccer ball and go, uh, you know, make me kick it against the side of the wall uh, by myself. And that definitely left this indelible mark on me, you know. Um, uh, and I think 
in many ways I've you know chosen uh, to kind of prove him wrong, <laughs> <laughs> and that's um, you know been you know in many ways I guess change proving a lot of people wrong because right. I think especially in the space of disability you know the fact that I'm the first woman to um, have done the Iron Man the first man to to do the Hawaii Iron Man was in 1985 it was this guy named Pat Griskis and then after him Jim McLaren had done it and and so but I did it in 2005 so that was 20 years later and mm-hmm. so you just think about um, you know really what you know women um, are now doing so many more things, but for a, a long time, women with disabilities didn't always uh, do a lot. And especially when you look at, you know, our history of how we, you know, um, include people with disabilities in our physical education uh, departments and um, through schools and throughout the country. I mean, you know, many parents are having to sue their their school districts to create sports opportunities for their kids with disabilities. So, right. I mean, there's still a struggle there. And, you know, sports are important for all kids. I mean, it's for their self-esteem to build their attitudes and for to teach them, life, you know, important life lessons. You know, I think sports are important for anybody, especially and for health and fitness, you know, for a lifestyle as well, you know. And it's important to teach these kids early on. So I just, you know, this is why I continue to crusade because it's still happening that, you know, kids with disabilities are often excluded and um, kept on the sidelines. So, Sarah, are you ever tempted to call that coach or send an article clipping? <laughs> yeah, you know, I did come out to um, an event of mine and, uh, you know, uh, we've uh, made amends. I actually wrote about it in my book in a single bound. And so it's, it's come full circle because something good came out of something bad. And that's I think what we all, you know, need to stri- you know, have, strive to do in life because, you know, the, the one thing that's sort of uh, indiscriminate is the fact that we're all going to have certain adversity and challenges in our lives and it's what we choose to do in those moments that really makes all the difference. And we talk about this a lot on the show, Sarah. This particular coach, as you said, he was your greatest motivator, so he was your greatest gift probably. He was a driving force to help you go and achieve all the wonderful things that you've been able to do in your life. Absolutely. And I mean, I've even had to, I look at my disability as a gift, you know, like it's Mm -hmm. something that I think has shaped, you know, it's not everything that I am, but it has shaped who I am, you know, of course. And um, I have, but I, so I sort of look at, you know, having a disability as a gift in, in some ways. When you have these changes and you come to these points in your life, you have two choices. You can either let it take over and and basically be an end of your life in some regard, or you can embrace it and go with it and and view it as a gift and see where it takes you. Absolutely. I mean, I firmly believe that, you know, um, I could, embracing my disability was a choice. I mean, I think this is, it was an epiphany that I had and, and I think doing sports helped my body feel strong and therefore has made my spirit strong and um, instead of dwelling on the fact that I don't have my leg I've chosen to uh, celebrate the fact that I still have my other leg and my arms and you know I use them and celebrate them every day that I go out there for a swim or a bike or a run and um, yeah I you know I that's I love being a triathlete and I love doing sport and You know, I think when I go out there and even just in my training, not just when I race, it's celebrating the body I have and not really uh, getting down about the things I don't have. Sarah, that's such an important lesson because we're talking about your leg, but this can relate to anything in someone's life when they focus on what they're missing. And as Sarah's saying, you need to turn that around and focus on what you do have, your blessings and your gifts. Sarah, I want to ask you, why running? What made you choose that sport? Well, I think it was probably, you know, in some ways, too, the least likely thing for people to, you know, for, for, for me to do. And not only that, I had met another runner um, who who was running, who was out there running on a prosthetic, so she gave me hope. And uh, it was a woman named Patty Rossback, and she was out there running on a prosthetic leg. And, and um, you know, it's, it's just once I did learn, it was a lot of fun. And I liked the pursuit of um, trying to be better and faster and 
you know, I just, it, it did build the confidence. I mean, I, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I still have fun today. I mean, of course, it is hard work. There are days when it's, it is, um, it, it isn't always easy, but I try to make it fun. And, and I, I think by signing up for races, too, that are in fun places or, you know, I work out with friends. Um, I make it like a social thing, too. You know, you you find a good master swim team and, you you know, it's like a good time to see those people, you know, twice a week when you're swimming or you're going to have a bike ride with friends and you can make an adventure out of it. You know, we often do workouts like, you know, we ride our bikes down to San Diego and take the train back, like, and it's a, f- a good time, you know, and mm-hmm. you get a couple of coffee and get back on the bike, um, get back up, you know, get on the train and rack your bike and, you know, you celebrate that you just, you know, rode 50 miles and it feels pretty good and you sleep well that night and you eat good food and, you know, you, it just all seems to feed on itself and you hang out with motivated people and it's a good time. And so I just, um, I know that by pursuing even, um, you know, and then that's what I love about triathlon and running. And I'm, my, I have two more races this season. It's a, a two more half marathons. And, um, you know, these are, you know, people who are all about um, having a good time but taking care of themselves and, you know, pursuing a finish line. And um, it's, it's, it's about, it's not just a sport, it's a lifestyle. Sir, a few months back, Mark Allen was on the show, and I asked him point blank if he was crazy. I mean, 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, 26.2 mile run. That's unimaginable for just about anyone. So what on earth compelled you to go for the Ironman championship? Well, you know, I, I think it's because I, I, funny enough, you know, from an early age, growing, you know, and starting my own little running stuff on the track, I hung out with people who were doing stuff like that, like the Ironman or doing ultra marathons. So the idea of normal, like what was normal, the definition of that was quite different. My, the guy who taught me to run was this man named David Balsley, who was, a uh, uh, would do the Western States. And, uh, he did it in like 17 hours and the Western States is a hundred mile run. And so, like, I just, I think, you know, that kind of thinking was early on, like, I was very impressionable then, and it kind of, it redefined what's normal. I was like, you know, if this this guy would, like, run from Long Island to Manhattan, like, that would be his training run. He would just run to work, you know, and... And that was his idea of normal. So I just, you know, when I heard about Iron Man and I met Jim McLaren, I just, I kind of thought like, oh, it's sort of normal and attainable. And and that's what really planted the seed. It was like, well, if these guys could do it, I can do it. And, uh, and, and uh, that's what came to be. So That's an unbelievable attitude. And we're going to let our listeners think about that for a moment while we take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Sapienza board-certified chiropractic physician and director of Mecca Integrated Medical Center located in Fairfield, New Jersey. Did you know low back pain is the number one cause of disability in the United States and that studies have shown 80% of the population will experience low back pain at some time in their lives? With the winter season upon us, there is an abundance of patients we see who have injured themselves from snow shoveling. Following these three simple steps will certainly decrease the chances of anyone needing an emergency visit to the chiropractor. Step one, a good investment is a lifting or support belt that can be purchased at any sporting goods store. These belts protect the spinal muscles and structures from injury and make the job easier to perform. Step two, proper form when shoveling snow includes bending at your knees and never at your back when lifting the load, keeping the load close to your center of gravity, which means no reaching or leaning throughout the entire movement, and keeping your back straight. In other words, there should be no twisting of the spine when lifting or tossing the snow. Step three, keep the shovel light. There is no need to load the shovel up with 40 or more pounds of snow each time. Weights like these force us to lose the proper form we talked about in step two and make us more susceptible to injury. You are better off lifting lighter loads and taking the extra five minutes to complete the job. Overexertion during exercise and repetitive motion injuries are one of the several causes of low back pain. While following the steps we talked about today certainly decrease the chances of back injury, there are circumstances where injury and pain occur anyway. Our office specializes in comprehensive, state-of-the-art, non-surgical treatment of back and neck pain. If you or someone you know is in pain and would like a complimentary consultation with one of our doctors, please contact my office at 973-943-4300 or on the web at www.mecca.com. 
Cetus Home Care Services is a non-medical home care company that assists you in caring for your loved one. Their trained caregivers provide the peace of mind that is important to you. Whether at home, in a nursing home, or an assisted living community, Cetus will help your loved one live a dignified, independent lifestyle. Cetus Home Care Services and professionals are as diversified as their clients. Call Cetus for more information, 973-746-0165, or visit CetusHomeCare.com. Change your attitude, change your life, and big, believe, inspire, grow. Salute the entrepreneurial spirit of small business owners, people who follow a dream, work hard, and make it happen. This week's Spotlight on Eileen Price Design is brought to you by REA, a global consulting firm that provides career and transition services to individuals and relocating families worldwide. Be soulful, be amazing, be yourself. These are a few of the taglines accompanying the colorful mandalas created by Eileen Price Design. Eileen's hand-drawn funky designs are what she calls organic doodles inspired by nature. This form of expression is the perfect union between her structured graphic design background and her inner artist. The creation of each mandala is a spiritual and meditative process for her. Eileen transforms her artwork into note cards, prints, jewelry, and other gift items. This past fall, she had her work represented by the artisan group at GBK Productions Emmy Awards Celebrity Gifting Suite in Los Angeles and also showed her work at an industry event at the Hamptons International Film Festival in Long Island, New York. You can view Eileen's work at Etsy.com or her website, EileenPriceDesign.com. Six months ago, I was transferred to Seattle, Washington. My family and I made the move. My wife, Kay, initially focused on getting our new home built, enrolling our children in school, and maintaining our temporary housing. Throughout the process, an REA consultant stayed in close contact with Kay until she was ready to start her job search. After Kay enrolled, her REA consultant called her about an opportunity that was a perfect fit. The consultant helped Kay update her resume, provided salary information and market comparisons, and coached her on interview strategies. Within two weeks, Kay was offered the position, and the REA consultant coached her through the salary negotiation process. Kay accepted the job. Thank you, REA, for making our move and transition easy. If you need career relocation assistance, career transition outplacement services, or executive coaching, contact the experienced professionals at REA. For more information, please visit r-e-a.com. This is professional career coach Elise Holtzman. Is your career in a rut? Do you wonder if things will ever change and secretly fear that they won't? Just as the quality of what you put in your stomach has an effect on your physical health, how you nourish your mind profoundly impacts your career success. It's important to continue to learn, whether it's acquiring a new skill, following industry trends, or simply broadening your horizons by learning more about yourself and the world. The possibilities for continuing your education are virtually endless. Read biographies of people you admire or descriptions of notable moments in history, take online classes, download free podcasts onto your MP3 player or computer, listen to motivational CDs in your car or subscribe to thought-provoking blogs. You never know what you might learn that could change your life. For more information about how to create career success and satisfaction, visit www.eliseholtzman.com or call me at 908-233-2273. Welcome back to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman, and our guest today is Sarah Reinertsen, an athlete, motivational speaker, mentor, and author of the book, In a Single Bound. Sarah, you've said that for you to keep up, you've always had to be tougher than the rest. Can you give our listeners some tips that can help us maintain a positive attitude and stay emotionally strong? Well, I think the the thing that uh, it it comes down to is that... um we're all going to face adversity, right? But mm-hmm. the things that you you get upset about should be the things, you know, there's a fine line between the things that you can change and the things that you cannot change. And so I don't worry or waste my energy with focusing on the things that I cannot change. I change the things that I can. And that's what I focus on uh, day to day. And and I think that uh, if you can learn the trick of that, you know, you can, um, it really helps, you know, because you've got to conserve your energy. That's part of mm-hmm. life. You know, and we're all juggling a lot of things. So you've know, you got to pick and choose what you're really going to worry about because <laughs> when you start sweating the small stuff, it's 
just a waste of energy. So you got to sweat, you know, the things that are big and continue to focus on the things that you can change. And what I love and I truly believe is that we have the ability to create and generate positive change in our life and create a new reality for ourselves. Um, And so, you know, I truly believe that. Well, you know, and we're talking about your competition and sporting events, but again, these are lessons that can be applied to anyone's lives. And so when you're in the middle of a race and you feel like you're hitting the wall, you just can't go on. How do you dig yourself out of that? How do you regain that tough mental attitude? Well, you know, I think that's... um, That's where it's (laughs) going out and doing these races a lot, too. It it reminds you of that, and it keeps that mental toughness about you strong. And, uh, you know, especially I always say the longer the distance, the longer the glory. And sometimes, too, when you're out there, you really also have those tougher mental games where you, you really are forced to kind of deal with your inner demons. And when your body is really screaming at you to stop, Mm-hmm. It is your mental fortitude that keeps your body moving forward. And that's true when you're out there on an Ironman when it's 140 miles. And through tough conditions, like on the island of Hawaii, it is hot and windy. And, like, the sun is relentless because there's not a drop of shade, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um you know, so you've got a lot of elements to fight against, and um, even the shorter races that I do, and you know, short is all relative, right? Whether you're doing 13 miles or you know, a half Ironman, which is you know, 1.2 mile swim, 56 bike, and 13 mile run, like it still gets tough out there. So I have sort of these mantras that I go back to that remind me that I'm tough and that I'm strong and that I've, if I've gone through, you know, this battle, I've, you know, before I can handle it again. And all you have to do is keep moving forward and move one foot in front of the other. And that's, you know, oftentimes a metaphor for life and uh, that you just have to keep moving forward. And then suddenly you go through a good patch again and you pick up your pace and, and uh, eventually you get to that finish line and, and uh, you can put both arms up in the air and, and feel that moment of victory. And, you know, and then, but, you know, then there's the next day and you just carry on. But I think that's why, if, I mean, for me, I really, to stay motivated, I keep signing up for that next race. And it's also what help, you know motivates me to stay fit and healthy in life. I mean, we all know we're supposed to go to the gym, you know, and take care of ourselves and work out three times a week. But when I'm signed up for a race, it really keeps me committed and focused on staying fit and living a active lifestyle. And Sarah, you've offered some wonderful advice there because I think that fear is often our greatest roadblock. So has there ever been a point in your life when you've allowed that fear to stop you from doing something? Well, you know, I, my motto is actually fear less, live more. And, and that came to me um, after having to face a lot of fear, actually, in, a, in an event I did called The Amazing Race. And I, I actually write about it a lot in, in my book, in a, in a Single Bound. I talk about my time on The Amazing Race because it, I was faced with so many things that um, really scared me. And uh, one of the greatest lessons I've learned, and I, and I had to, like, learn that lesson, like, every episode, truthfully, mm-hmm. <laughs> was that you can't let fear stop you. You, you're, you might feel it, but you you do it anyway. <laughs> and, um, you know, even so we choose to be fearless, but mm-hmm. I'm not saying you, if you, even in the face of, even if you're not fearless in the moment, you just have to fear less and do it anyway and live more. And when, and you live more when you do, you actually, um, you know, I, I'm f- afraid of heights. Okay. And so on the amazing race, I kept having to climb And I never would have experienced these incredible vistas, like, you know, that were at the top of the, you know, you can only feel like you're on the top of the world if you face the fear and climb that mountain. And wasn't it true you scaled the Great Wall of China during that competition, correct? Yeah, we had to do it like on a, on a rope, you know, like uh, scrambling up the side of it. Mm -hmm. And then we also climbed uh, the, the Kuwait Tower, which is I believe the same height about uh, more or less than the Empire State Building, and we scaled the side of the that tower, like, you know, 
That must have been incredible. (laughs) So, yeah, it was incredible. But it was windy, too, you know, and 140 degrees. So (laughs) also extreme conditions. So it's it's tough, and that's – it's it's good to um i think adversity makes you stronger and uh more resilient and Sarah looking at your life now your accomplishments are these things that you could have ever imagined for yourself I couldn't have imagined it and that's why i think in some this is why i look at my disability as a gift because i i think i have chosen uh, a much different path for myself because of this gift Um, I mean, perhaps I would have done it if I was born with two healthy legs, but I don't, um, I don't know. One, One never knows, right? The book is In a Single Bound by Sarah Reinertsen. If you'd like more information about Sarah, you can visit her website, alwaystry.com. That's T-R-I, alwaystry.com. You can always visit our website, which is C-Y-A-C-Y-L.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Listen to Past Joseph's podcast, read our digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and now participate in our new book club. Sarah, thank you so much for stopping by and spending time with us. I really look forward to following your career, and I look forward to having the chance to speak with you again. Joan, thank you so much for the chat this morning. And I'd like to leave our listeners with Sarah's motto, and I hope that you would bring this into your life. Fear less, live more. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.